morning. Um, <clears throat> last time I was able to share, I talked about um, the the courtroom incident uh, about a month ago or so. And before that, I talked about um, the Ironman triathlon and uh, Team Hoyt, which was the father and son duo um, that were able to go to the World Championship for triathlon, which, as an update for that, they have been moved into the Hall of Fame for the sport as a whole. Um, they will forever be honored together, um, which I think is incredible. That happened about a few weeks ago. Um, but what I'd like to share today is uh, it's much different, though it can relate in some way. Um, I feel like God has been, uh, he's been trying to reveal certain things as I'm reading in the word more now than I have ever. Um, I consume a lot of media that is, um, has to do with comedy, that is, you know, it's entertainment. I listen to a lot of podcasts from some of my favorite YouTubers and stuff. Um, and something I keep hearing from them, because most of them are not believers, uh, is that perhaps they once were. Some of them were raised uh, Jewish, some were raised Catholic. Um, and a lot of them will say that uh, they believed for most of their life. They grew up in church or wherever, and that eventually they would see someone who was suffering so much and they kept believing that they would that God would free them of it and that God would bring them out of it and that person died or that person seemingly never got better um, and it's a, it's a theme that I keep seeing even throughout some music that I listen to too um, this is the, the first few lines of a song that I had been listening to uh, by a band called Circa Survive. And the lyrics say, When I found out about the Lord, I wanted more. But I never could believe that there was something that had so much love for us that could sit there and let us bleed to death. And this is an idea that plagues many people, is that we, as Christians, if we believe in God, then we'll never suffer, that we'll never see pain, that we'll never go through these trials. Um, and the works of uh, Frederick Nietzsche was a philosopher. Uh, his founding line of philosophy was, to live is to suffer, to survive is to find some meaning in the suffering. Um, and... I think that there's some truth in that. Um, to live here on earth is to suffer. Much of life is suffering. Um, you wake up in the morning and you know your back may hurt. You know that's, these are just limitations of the human body. It degrades over time, and our bodies feel pain. It's to usually is to tell us that something is wrong, but that's not always true because if pain meant that something was wrong, that would mean exercising is unhealthy for a lot of people. That would mean that eating spicy food is unhealthy or bad for us. And that's just, it's just not true always. Um, so seemingly as a society, we have in some ways regressed back to an Elizabethan era of an era that, uh, stressed social status and the the outward appearance and even within the church and i don't mean this church i mean the church being as a whole the church the body of christ um is a we have to look like we are believers we have to look like god is doing something amazing and that we've been set free and we always have to demonstrate that somehow and we've moved we've lost the idea of the lament, which is the expression of grief or sorrow. It's seemingly that 
you find less and less in these large sermons that talk about how, you know, God died so that we wouldn't have to suffer. God died, or Jesus died and rose so that we wouldn't have to suffer. He died so that our finances could be good. And this is a, this is kind of a lie that has found itself into, uh, through the prosperity gospel, into much of the church. And it spreads like venom to the people that are really hurting because they feel like maybe they're not believing hard enough. Maybe they're not, they're not reading their Bible enough and that's why they're hurting. And maybe they're separated from God or in sin in some way. And it just isn't always true. Sometimes we can be doing everything right. We can be having all of our heart and devotion for God correctly directed, but we still feel pain. We still feel separation from God. And I don't know how we can, how we can push away that idea that we cannot feel grief. We cannot feel sorrow. That is, that is an idea that the Bible does not put forth. I mean, a third of the Psalms are David saying, Oh Lord, how long will you forsake me? David was a man after God's own heart. We all say this. We all know this. And yet some of us will turn a blind eye to a third of his teachings, a third of his own words, feeling separated from God. This is inherent within all parts of the Bible. Paul especially talks about it. Is that there are times when we will feel separated from God, but we are not. Even within sin, God is there. In Philippians, Paul talks, he writes a letter to the church of Philippa. Philip, Philippa, Philippi. I don't remember. <laughs> I can't say it right. Uh, he says, For it has been granted to you, for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. It has been granted to you like a gift. And that hurts because when I think of a gift, I want to open the present and I want to be overjoyed with it. But a gift, the gift is that suffering is often the thing that can draw us closest to God, but can also be used as a means of escape from God. And I can say this firsthand is when I was working at the post office, which for me, I know it, it, for some people it may seem like not a lot, but for me it's the hardest thing I, I have gone through yet. Um, just tireless hours and, uh, you know, working every Sunday pretty much, not being able to come to church. And it just over time it wears on you and wears on you. And I started to feel that, like, God, where are, where are you? Like, why aren't things getting better? And... Uh, I slowly worked my way into this dark, dark place of thinking that God had forgotten about me. Even though I knew it wasn't true, I, I, I felt it so strongly. And, and sometimes I felt wrong about it. But now that I can look back, now that I'm no longer in it, I can look back and say, yes, God was there. And that's all well and good. But in that moment, I was sitting there thinking, that there was no reason. If, if God isn't here, if God isn't with me, then there's no reason to live anymore. And I felt alone in that. But there are other people that feel that. And it's, in some cases, normal to feel that. I know for, for Paul, he, uh, he spent a great deal of time in jail. Most of his works are from a prison cell. Most of what ended up in the Bible, he wrote in a prison cell. And they didn't have TV in their prisons. Um, in a letter to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. How beautiful is that? 
How beautiful is it to know that our suffering was not an accident. Our suffering is something that God has allowed to happen in our lives that will only be for our good because God's plan is good. God's plan is perfect. No part of it goes unchecked. No one that is suffering goes unseen. And so we have this question, well, if God is so good, how, how could he allow good people to suffer in such ways? And it just, it is a thought that comes from a misunderstanding of the gospel. Is that we don't, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve his love, his grace. We don't deserve for our suffering to go unnoticed. But God sees it. He transcends that idea. And I'll give one example. Is, uh, I recently watched the movie Silence, uh, which is a Martin Scorsese film that talks about Jesuit priests that left from Portugal and went to Japan to find their, uh, their old mentor that had recanted all of his teachings of the Bible said that it was, none of it was true anymore, that he didn't believe in any of it. So they go on a mission to find this man. And along the way, they find these people that are persecuted. They find these people that are living in huts and in hiding from the Japanese government and military. This is a time during the 16th century or 1600s uh, when, the, when it was illegal to be Christian in Japan. And they found that these people had the greatest faith that they had ever seen. They were impressed with their faith because through their oppression, their faith has only grown stronger and their desire to hear from God, their desire to, to eat up his word was bolstered by every bit of opposition they faced in their land. Paul talks in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. He says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Though life is suffering, it is also a gift. It strengthens us in order to face the next obstacle. It strengthens us in order for us to share the gospel. And it's coming to my realization that the gospel is is more misunderstood maybe now than ever. Uh, many teachers uh, have spoken out of out of their line and and have have misrepresented the gospel. And for some people that have never heard it, this is their only it's their only experience with the gospel. Maybe something completely wrong. It could be something that is completely misinterpreted. And um, through us, because we know, we know the truth, we have seen the truth, we have had experiences with God, every one of us here, we may be the only contact with good theology that some of these people may see. And it, we should not let our suffering keep us from sharing that gospel because you may find that when you're speaking to someone who is completely lost you may find that in your suffering you still have those truths within your heart you still have the word to carry you through when you share that with someone else and i have found that very true in the past few months in just speaking of the gospel within normal conversations day to day I realize that I have something that carries me through the, the low, the depths that other people may find themselves in.
But suffering is a gift, even if it is an extremely painful one. And it is hard to say, and it is hard to accept when you are in it. But it does not go unseen. Okay. Um, Sarah's going to come and share what God's put upon her heart. I was ready to bow out because I sometimes feel like I repeat myself. And uh, I was talking to Richard one day and I said, uh, can you just give me a theme word that you're sharing so I can see if I'm kind of on the same thing? And he's like, it's okay, don't worry about it. Just whatever you want to share. I'm like, yeah, but I just... I want to be right. I want God to use me and me not be in the way. And then Alex and Liz came over and I said, Alex, can you just give me a theme of what you... But amazingly, it was all the same theme. I was like, thank you, Lord. But a different outlook on it. You know, Alex says that... Um, that's, that gift of suffering... You know, they promise that we're going to have the trials. We're going to have those. We're going to have them either way. It just depends on how we go through it. You know, I would read my devotional and I'd read my Bible and I would come across First Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange, some strange thing happened to you. And I would slam my devotional shut, close my Bible, and rebuke the devil. But the trial comes anyway. And we do find ourselves in a place where we react surprised. And I know... Many of you may not ever say things like this, but I'll tell you some of the things I said, but I will also tell you some of the things that God said. My reaction to certain things was, Lord, I have served you all these years faithfully as much as I could, and this is how you pay me back. as if he owes me anything. And through it, even though we don't mean to, we distance ourselves from him. Even though he's the only one that can help us, even if he's the only one with the answer, Because it's too painful to talk about sometimes. And then shame comes in. That we're ashamed of what's happened. And we put ourselves in a place when we see people that they may mention something close to something that we're going through. And we think, oh, they know. They know my secret. And it puts you in a quiet place, distancing yourself, not just from God, but from people around you. And that's when the enemy comes in. He wants to take us out. And even though God may allow these things to come in as trials for us, he's teaching us something through it. And when the enemy wants to separate you because you're ashamed, it just puts you in a, in a prison away from everybody. From, from anyone that can speak life to you from um, from God and 
And if you're doing anything for God, well, now comes a place where you don't want to do anything for him anymore. Not because you don't love him, because you don't feel like you're worthy because of the shame. And when you take a back seat, the enemy has a point there because he's put you out of the place that God has put you in. Uh, The enemy's winning at this point. But you know, when you're going through the things that you go through, God doesn't condemn you. He's not disappointed with you. He waits patiently. Because he's doing something inside of you. He's making you a a man or a woman of God of everything that you've asked for. That I would love you with all my heart and serve you with all my heart. And you know, when, when pain comes in, no matter how it comes in, whether it's through sickness, whether it's rejection of, of friends, uh, whether it's uh, pain from a spouse, or the pain the parents feel when their teenagers have trampled on their hearts and their kids become strangers to you. God knows exactly what's going to break our hearts. But he's doing something. He's teaching you something. Alex talked about Paul. And Paul was in, um, in the desert for three years. He was, uh, he knew everything about God. He knew, his, he knew the scriptures. He knew everything. And then he got converted. And then he went in the desert for three years. And then I wonder if in the desert he wondered. I've had this teaching and I know all this. And now all of a sudden, I have this truth of Jesus. I'm thinking it maybe took him three years in the desert to try to put Jesus and what he's learned together. When we go through stuff, it's like we're in the desert. We can't see up, we can't see down, can't see far ahead. But we know this thing has happened. How does it fit with what I've learned and know about God? How do I get through this? He'll show you. He will show you. The things that we go through are not just for us. And when we're going through them, we really don't want to hear somebody say, well, it's because one day you'll be able to encourage somebody. You want to say, get out of here. That is not what I want to hear right now. I think the biggest thing going through things my reaction to different things. God showed me my heart and where I was at. When something goes wrong, and I know Alex mentioned that, you know, we're supposed to have the the best life, being prosperous, no pain, no nothing. And that if everything's going good, 
then that's a good Christian life. And for some people it is. But when we do go through things, it's like God doing two things at the same time. Revealing what's in your heart and what comes out. Revealing the unbelief and the doubting after he's been faithful to you all these years. And yet, now that you find yourself in this trial, you're wondering where he's at. Now, like Alex says in the back of your head, you know he's there somewhere. But for some reason, not right now with me. Because I can't see you. I remember going through something and coming to church, and oh, I'm sure y'all might believe, might remember it too. But I was so overwhelmed with what was going on that I just spilt my guts. Afterwards, thought, "Oh well, that's where I'm at, though." Is saying, "God, I don't see you in this. Where are you?" And disappointed with him because he wasn't quick to respond. But the one thing that he promises, I'm going to walk through it with you. I have not forsaken you. I'm with you. And if you read your Bible, you will find over and over and over it says, fear not. Take courage. Now, for those that don't have a problem with that, then that's probably not for you. But for some reason, God has it in the Bible. And I've read this 300 and something times. Then I've read 103 times. So apparently he has it in there a lot because he's talking to us. So he must know that we're going to be in a place one day where we need to hear, fear not, take courage. I am with you. He says it over and over and over. So as the enemy has you down and it's kicking you while you're down and telling you how much you should be ashamed and how God cannot use you anymore because look at the shame that's been brought upon you and your family. God says something different. He says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And as he's telling you these things, and you've been on the ground with the enemy kicking you, and you weeping, And having no hope and feeling like, I don't know what happened here. Very gently. Stands you to your feet. Wipes your tears away. Lifts up your head. Raises your hands and your arms. Loves you. And when you can breathe again, teaches you how to fight, how to recognize when the enemy's coming, how to recognize when the enemy's speaking to you, how to recognize when those are lies of the enemy, and your ears being so sensitive to the Lord when he's speaking to you and speaking truth. I remember one service when Sharon told a story. Of course, I can't remember the story, but I can remember the main thing that she got across. It was about a man that was going through something. And the enemy's mocking him. And it says, what are you going to do now? And the man gets a chair, 
plants it down, sits down, and he's just going to sit down and praise the Lord in front of you. In defiant of the enemy. The best thing you can do is be defiant in front of the enemy's face. Because when you do, his tormenting lies, his mocking voice, the fears that he comes to you with, the condemnation of the what ifs, and what a horrible parent or whatever it is he has you hanging over, that you are, they cease. Because you are taking in the truth of God and believing him. But you know, it is all something that God brings you through. Little at a time. But it's a wonderful thing to see what he does with you in it. Because he's so wonderful. He's so beautiful. And he doesn't let you go through it alone. And one more thing. I'm going to read this little thing, and I hope you understand it. I will explain it if you don't. It says, one does not write what has already been written. One writes out of the storehouse of fresh revelation and his own personal knowledge and gain through the painful experience of growth. You cannot escape the growing experience without forfeiting the other. You shall cease writing if you cease learning. You do not learn as you write, but you write as you learn. We'll be taught by God, because that's what we've asked. Teach us your word. Show us, your, show us yourself. And he does. Unfortunately, it's through some pain. But you know what? I've asked God, let my life be worth something. Whatever I have to go through, let me come out with something from it. But don't let it be bitterness or anger. But something worth And as he's told us that when we go through these things, you're going to comfort those with the same comfort that he's comforted you. I think when Alex said that when he sees people going through things and he realizes that there's something different in there that's in him, that he knows the difference between someone else, it's because it's something God is doing inside of us. And then when we share it, or we encourage, it's worth something. I don't want to be someone that just gives empty words and read my word and it just be empty. Or say a word to someone and it just be meaningless. That's what I have. Well, this week, while I was trying to figure out Lord, what, what do I share? I don't know what to share. What is it that you're, you know, I'm not, I can't stand up here and give you a, a sermon or, you know, I don't, I don't have that skill. But I want to, I, it was on actually, uh, I'll just tell you what happened to me because I've been asked, Lord, give me something because I don't know what to do. And, um. Anyway, I was reading in the morning my favorite uh, guy, Charles Spurgeon. But this was uh, on the 7th of November. And as I was reading it, let me just, I'm going to read it to you and then I'll tell you what I got, what came from that. 
And this is the way God talks to me different times to these things. But um, it's that, it says, as ye have therefore received. Oh, no, that's wrong. Sorry, wrong day. <laughs> okay, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy walls are continually before me, from Isaiah 49, 16. So I started reading, and it says, No doubt to part of the wonder which, which is concentrated in the word behold is excited by the unbelieving lamentation of the preceding sentence. Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. How amazed the divine mind seems to be at this wicked unbelief. What, can, what could be more astounding than the unfounded doubts and fear of God's favored, favored people? The Lord's loving word of rebuke should make us blush. He cries, how can I have forgotten thee when I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands? How darest thou doubt my, my constant remembrance? when the memorial is set upon my very, my very flesh. O oh, unbelief, how strange or marvel thou art. We know not which most, which most to wonder at, the faithfulness of God or the unbelief of his people. He, he keeps his promise a thousand times, and yet the next trial makes us doubt him. He never faileth. He, he is never a dry well. He is never as a setting sun, a passing meteor, or a melting vapor. And yet, we are continually vexed with anxieties, molested with suspicions, and disturbed with fears, as if God were a mirage of the desert. Behold, is the word intended to excite admiration. Here indeed, we have a theme up for marveling. Heaven and earth may well be astonished that the rebels should obtain so great a nearness to the heart of infinite love as to be written upon the palm of his hands. I have graven thee. It does not say thy name. The name is there, but that is not all. I have graven thee. See the fullness of this. I have graven thy person, thine image, thy case, thy circumstances, thy sins, thy temptations, thy weaknesses, thy wants, thy works. I have graven thee. Everything about thee, all that concerns thee, I have put thee all together there. Will thou ever say again that thy God has forsaken thee when he has graven thee upon the palms, palm of, my, of his own, oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Graven thee upon his own palms. And I thought, oh, you know, that just spoke to me. And I said, I looked at it, and I said, let me look up this. Because I said, oh, it doesn't say, because in my head I was thinking, thy name but no it's much more than this anyway i went to isaiah forty nine sixteen, and when i got there i realized that this is the very scriptures that god had given me over my son my elder son back in 2015 which god had given my wife many years before that let me find it here. Give me a moment. Okay, here it is. I'm just going to read uh, 49, 15 through 18, and then one part of uh, verse 23. Because these are the things I had underlined. It says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? So she may forget. I will not forget you. See, I have engraven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your sons hasten back. 
and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your sons gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. And this verse down in 23, the one part of it, it says, For those, those who hope in me will not be disappointed. And with that, when I read those, I knew God was talking to me about my son. Which uh, I don't know how much I've shared. I don't remember. I've shared with different people that uh, the struggle we've had with him in his teen years and even now. But my point is I want to just share a little bit. Going back quite a few years for me, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. But we were having issues with my older son. And I would, I set myself to pray. To pray like I've never prayed before. I mean, I went to Bible school. I was in this church a long time. But this, this time... This time was a time where I felt very alone. The church had taken a different place in my heart. I was a young Christian when I came, coming out of the world, and God did wonderful things in delivering me and setting me free. And, but anyway, point being, this is after many years, and a lot of people had God had taken to other places. People had left. And I felt I did not have someone strong to lean upon. I thought I could go to, in the past, well, we could do like other people did. They'd send their child to Argentina, and they'd come back, and God do wonderful works. But that opportunity wasn't for us now, because that wasn't it, the timing. Things had changed. And so, but what I come to realize is God didn't want me to do that because he wanted me to come to him he wanted me to get all I need not through man God uses man and does wonderful things but for me he just wanted to be me and him and my wife of course but anyway point being he um, the more I prayed for my son the worse things got I would pray and pray and I think okay God, you're supposed to come to my rescue here. You're supposed to change this before it gets too bad. Before, be, you know, now is the time. Because this is what I thought it was supposed to be. Because this is what, what I groomed or gleaned through the years. But what I came to realize is uh, it was a time to find out what was mine and what belonged to someone else. My relationship with God or someone else's relationship with God. But my point, well, my point, I'm not sure. The parts that I share, excuse me if I get a little confused with some situations, but there was a couple of things I just wanted to point out during that time. It was a very difficult time, and I know that God used it in our, in our lives, in our hearts, to develop a deeper walk in relationship with the Lord. And the answers didn't come the way I'd hoped them to come. The way I pictured it should be didn't happen. But the more I sought the Lord, you know, uh, I'll just say that I, I had to go to work. And at this time, I couldn't, it was hard just to, I couldn't focus. I couldn't concentrate on my, my job. I had a job to do. I had to go every day. And yet, it was seeing like, all I could do was get through this day. Lord, get me through this day, one day at a time. Because uh, it was very difficult, is my, my uh, point. But the thing that God showed me at one point, I was, thinking, I was involved teaching Sunday school back in those days. And um, 
struggling what was happening with, with our home. And uh, the Lord spoke to me through Psalms with two verses. Because I was wanting to actually, I wanted to go where nobody knew my name. I wanted to disappear. But God wouldn't release me from this place. I just wanted to go run and hide and goodbye. But the Lord let me know that he didn't want me to do that. But this, I wanted to bring out Psalm 126. Because I was ready just to throw in the towel. So I can't do this. And yet, I had nowhere else to go. God, am I going to run from you? I know. I don't want to be out there without you. But this is what he spoke to me. In Psalm 126, verse 5. Like I said, I was a Bible, not a Bible, I was a Sunday school teacher at that time. And I just wanted to quit doing everything because I thought, I can't do any of this. But anyway, it says, those in NIV, it says, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who carries, who goes out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now, whether I interpret this wrong or something else, all I know is this is what God spoke to me through this, was the fact of, yes, you're in a time of tears, but carry on. Carry on through your pain. Carry on through the, the, the tears that you are shedding. However long they may last, leave that to me. But there you will come carrying you will return with songs of joy and carrying sheaves with you. So keep on pressing on. And that's the way God, God spoke, shared that with me. And I wish I could say we were, we were done. Done with our, our thing. Our things change, circumstances change, but we're still waiting. We're still waiting in so many areas, but... However short or long our trial is, they're all, everybody's different. Every situation's different. Every, every trial is different. So I hope on anybody, no, not, not as long as we've had to, but God has a purpose in it. And, you know, I remember years ago, that I used, years ago I used to live up the street, and I used to jog back and forth, back and forth back and forth. I go up the street all the way down to Stonewall Tell to, to the end and then back and stuff. But anyway, and I'd be running and running and the, the things were happening in the church and things were kind of crazy and a uh, time of very uh, shaking. But as I was running, I would hear the guy, run the race. Continue to run the race. You're running the race. Don't quit. Don't stop. And so we continued. We continued and, and, and obeyed the Lord in, in, in staying where he wanted us to stay for that time. Which is here, and he still hasn't released me to go somewhere else. And now that I'm getting up there in years, I, I guess I'll be here till it takes me home. But you never know, right? You never know what tomorrow will bring. But anyway, point being that I realize now, those, especially back then, that those times were actually precious and a gift of God. Because had, I not, had we not gone through what we did in those years... My relationship, my walk, my prayer life would be drastically different. And, uh, you know, there's one, one, one thing I want to share. And I don't, 
I've shared this with a couple of people. And I don't know if they thought I was a little off or not, but I'm going to share it anyway. <laughs> but anyway. It was a time that, uh, this is many years later. Actually, it was when my son came back. And my son wound up in jail. And we had to um, put a restraining order on him because of different things that had taken place. And we had to go to court and all that kind of stuff. And... There was a day we supposed to, they were supposed to hand them the restraining order, I mean the papers for it, and we had to give it to him in court. And it happened to be his birthday that day. Excuse me a minute. And I, I really struggled having done that, had to do this to hand this over because it was, it was saying to him, we reject you. And it just was killing me. And I was talking to the Lord about it, saying how much it pains me to do this. I didn't want to have to do this, but this is where we find ourselves. And as I was praying, I realized, I mean, God just was right there for me. And what I believe the Lord told me is this is a small taste. You're experiencing a small taste of what I had to do the, when I had to reject my son on the cross. When he was on the cross, the pain I felt, this was just a minute taste of that, of what God, the Father, experienced or felt and so through my pain and my struggle God was revealing something to me about himself and so my point is no matter our pain no matter our trial like they've already said that God is in it and I've asked the Lord, Lord, I want to know you. I want to be like you. And I know I have a long way to go, but I'm thankful, even though I wish that time was over and we'd see our son following hard after the Lord at this time. But God knows the right and it may not turn out the way I hope it will turn out. But it will be better because God knows the eternal. He knows it all. And now he's just asking me to trust him with my son, with my daughter, and with my youngest son. Trust me because I got him. I've got them. And then I, going through the difficult times, I'd be up here. And I'd have to get up and start praying and singing. But what I was doing when I was singing and lifting my voice and declaring how great is my God. In the face of the enemy that's laughing in my ear, I've got you, son. No, you don't. He belongs to the Lord God. You died, Lord, for my son. But when we declare in the face of the enemy, when we shoot those arrows, there's power. There's things happening in the invisible we don't realize. So don't let the enemy shut your mouth in whatever phase that you're in, no matter what trial you're going to, through. Praise the Lord. Determined to praise him, whether you feel like he's there or not, whether you feel good or whether you feel bad, whether you feel defeated or whether you feel great. Declare how great is your God because he has won the victory. It's already won. 
So don't let him shut your mouth. Don't let him stop you from doing and obeying what God has put in your heart to do. What he's called you to do. And so that's basically what I uh, had to share. I didn't feel to share any more of it. It was those two things, basically. But I know that God just would draw near to me in those times of prayer. Not always, of course. There's times I go and it seemed like, God, where are you? Where are you? And then one time, you just making that specific time to always be there. That God would meet with you. Make that time, no matter what season you're in, make that time that the Lord may speak to you and comfort you when you need comfort, to encourage you when you need encouragement, to scold you when you need to be scolded. But it's all in love. 